Good afternoon, everyone. Please rise as we begin our meeting today. Welcome to the Cade Museum Garage for our meeting today on the last day of January the 31st, 2023, the Rotary Club of Gainesville. My name is Tom Collette, your Sergeant at Arms for our meeting today and through what, June 30th, I think, end of the year. So we'll start as we do with song and pledge. You ready, Gordon? My country tis of thee. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my father, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom be. Now please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Now please remain standing for our invocation today, offered by Lori Vidal. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I have been asked by Greg uh, to acknowledge two longtime members who have lost loved ones here recently. Uh, Jerry Painter's brother uh, passed away. I believe his name is Jim. And um, Cornelia Holbrook's mother, Giovanna, also passed away. So please remember Jerry and Cornelia and their families uh, during this time of loss. Uh, let's pray together. We have placed before us a lofty goal as Rotary to invest ourselves in those things that are true, fair, beneficial to all and create goodwill and better friendships. Help us each one to embrace these lofty goals afresh here today. May we seek to be really good communicators, guided by our unity around our international commitment to this four-way test. I pray in your name. Amen. Thank you very much, Lori. If you're visiting us today, either a visiting Rotarian or a guest of one of our Rotarian members, please remain standing. Jason Shank has the wireless microphone. That beard's coming in very well, too, Jason. Thank you. Hello, Rotarians. I'd like to introduce my wife, who's a visiting Rotarian, Karen Thomas. She's with UF. Fellow Rotarians, my guest is Kate Valoy and she is the Associate Director of UF Parent Plan Giving. Kate. Again, Bob and uh, Connie Crane from Iowa. Uh, we come here about every week, it seems. We show up, yeah. So. Anyway, Iowa represented. Always good to see you. What's the temperature check in Iowa today? Seven yesterday. Glad you're here in the yeah, 80s. Glad you're here. Rotarians, Ed Ellett, and just to satisfy curiosity, this is not a sunburn that I have today. I am in the home stretch of a uh, Effidex chemical face peel, so I can keep going fishing more and more as time goes on. <clears throat> my, I have as my guest today my wife, Marsha. You might uh, say it's the beauty and the beast today. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, we've both been to the dermatologist, and I win the prize. Way to go, Ed. I thought you were hired as an extra in the latest Marvel movie. We have a series of announcements for you today. First, please join me in welcoming to the microphone Jeff Montgomery. Um, I have my Christmas red on today. Some of you may remember back at the Christmas party, I issued a bit of a challenge for us uh, Rotarians and doing something a little bit different for Christmas. Uh, I got some amazing responses. I left my card in the little envelope and people wrote me and it was wonderful. I'd like to recognize those who did that. Uh, Mary Beth Kuzmicki, Shane McIntosh, Jenny Van Hart, Paul and Christine Gibbs, Susan Maston, 
David Gracie, Steve Elder, Melanie Shore, Helen Kornblum, Jane Moraski, Nancy Hart, Orlando, Marion Colburn, Stephanie Steckel, Brendan Shortley, Colleen Keene, and TJ Pache. I left out one because I wanted to read to you what this wonderful Rotarian wrote, because it's inspiring, I think. She wrote, I was thinking, what can we do right before Christmas to make someone's life better? My friend Ralph and I bowl together every Friday, and it's our tradition to go to Sonny's afterward. And over the years, we've gotten to know a waitress there. She is super sweet and knows our order by heart. A few weeks ago, we stopped in and she looked so tired and I commented on it. She looked so dejected as she said she had a doctor's appointment that day. And then I saw two huge lumps on her neck and one on her arm. My friend is a doctor. And when Nikki left us, my friend said, I bet it's lymphoma. We were comforting and both gave her a $100 tip. Last week when we came in, they had a donation box for her and all they would tell us was that it was very serious. So we put money in the box, but her predicament hasn't left me. Tomorrow, I'm going to write her a subscription. I want to be a real award of the Paul, Paul Harris um, Fellowship. Yes, yeah, she didn't want it for herself. And so I asked her who she'd like to award this, uh, this medal and this wonderful gift. And she told me the most deserving person she could think about is our president, Greg Young. So please welcome Greg to the podium, our newest Paul Harris fellow. And yes, I did it in a little over two minutes. <laughs> Yeah. That was great, wasn't it? He was standing up to cut you off, not to come up and get the award. He said, you're on time, brother. Up next, the guy who uh, sounds like a wrestler, Bill Stasiewicz. Come on up. Woo! Greg, Greg gave me three minutes. I begged him for five, and that's why I was outside passing out my smiley faces. I'm here to talk to you about recruitment and retention, the recognition and engagement. And I have a part of a magazine article from our president, international president, Jennifer Jones. It says, Rotary recently surveyed our members and found something that should be unsurprising but still cause many of us in the Rotary leadership to sit up and pay attention. The single most important factor in member satisfaction is the club experience. How at home you and your club, how rewarding club meetings are, and how engaged you feel in special service projects. I have seen this firsthand across the Rotary world this year. When members feel an emotional connection to their club, they cannot imagine leaving, and that connection is often forged in rotary moments when people feel that special connection to the people around them and the impact of their service. Our Image Impact Tour is all about shining lights on those rotary moments and encouraging our members to those stories. This last weekend, our President Greg Young, the newest Paul Harris felt, 
spent his entire Saturday driving to, attending, and then returning from a workshop on the above topic, how to attract and retain Rotarians. He asked me to attend, but due to a prior commitment, I didn't go. Mind you, I'm sure there's much great information and shared ideas, but the, at this point, I have failed to execute those ideas that I feel, based upon my years in business, that will lead to Rotarians not only want to stay in this club, but want to encourage others. I know Greg's has planned to share with you learnings at a later date. First of you have the Rotary Random Rotary Recognition Card. And I encourage it to use to show your appreciation to fellow members for their commitment to bringing a guest, for their service projects, their spot on questions, or just your general appreciation and how you were invited to their table. Make a connection. Write a simple note and deliver it with love and appreciation. If you need more, I have plenty, and I'm willing to make them. The pick six, which is the eight by 10 sheet of paper, is a little more complicated. You see, we have over 200 registered Rotarians in this club, and we have 100 in attendance. That's including those on Zoom. Now, they're gone for multiple reasons, work requirements, vacations, doctor appointments, and various other reasons that folks are absent from week to week. Here's three I'd like to highlight. Chad King prior president to this club. Chad is out doubling the size of his business and is all in in becoming the king of king in insurance. I've invited him twice and he's still not here. Too busy with business. I suspect that there's someone out there, maybe Jason, with a call from you, who would bring him in from time to time. Kirk Smith. He's the big happy guy that runs the kitchen from Seafood Spectacular and the Wild Game Foods. He's the owner of Crystal Air and Water. He's got an HVAC company. He's overworked and understaffed. I begged him but to no avail. But he's still there cooking in the kitchen. Then there's Jim Craig, past president, 41-year member, and eight-time Paul Harris fellow. In his last acceptance speech, he just about cried, speaking about the people in Rotary and why it's so long. Many of you know that he's battling cancer. I'm not sure the type, but he's battling it alone. I suspect there's more Jim Craigs out there than there are Chad Kings, and I am encouraging you, each of you, to reach out to six, four, or just one member, ask them about their absence, general information, and just say hello. Create a rotary moment. Invite them to your table next week and find out more about them. Most, if not all, members of this club have an incredible life story to tell. If only somebody would inquire and listen. The average age of this club is pushing 65. And many of our members or their spouses, parents, children, and grandchildren are demanding more and more of their time. Reach out, make a call. In this area of social media, text messages, and email, a real person on the other end of the phone is a real creep. Especially if that someone is homebound for COVID conscious and many multiple other reasons. So I'm encouraging, in the words of Jeff, and Jennifer Jones to create rotary moments by reaching out and touching someone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Up next, to give us more about the Wild Game Feast, John Thomas to the microphone. Please welcome him. Hello, Rotarians. Uh, just a couple of real quick announcements. We have our first workday this weekend. We'll have another one the weekend after, and one the weekend right before the feast. We are about a week away before our deadline for sponsors to be on the t-shirt, so it's really important that we get those sponsorship forms in this week. You know, we're going to have a lot of fun and fellowship uh, for the workdays and the feast itself. But really, we got to drive uh, raising those dollars. 
We're going to have tickets and raffle tickets. We're not going to let you leave until you buy some today. Thank you very much, John. And now we turn the meeting over to your president, Greg Young, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for all the announcements. It's wonderful. Bob, Elena, I didn't get to thank you because I was so taken aback. But thank you so much for this honor. I really want you to know I appreciate that greatly and I appreciate what the members of this club do. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so good afternoon. Happy to have you here. Uh, wonderful meeting today, and we're so glad you could join us. Um, so following up on, on John and Bill's announcements, um, one of the takeaways I took from this meeting this weekend is there's three ways, primary ways, that we can make a club vibrant, help our clubs become engaging. Uh, first is ha having excellent programs. I think today we have one, just such program. That's an example of what brings people back to the meetings. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, I've heard you speak. Um, and then also, number two, regular fellowships. So we have the Wild Game Feast coming up. Prior to that, we have a fellowship that's in the works. And I'll tell you more about that as the date gets closer. But remember, um, Thursday, March 2nd, Wild Game Feast. Get your tickets and get them on the way out uh, today. So please do, and sponsorships, please continue with those. The third area of engaging members and keeping them wanting to be rotarians is in providing uh, hands-on service opportunities in the community. Now, as many of you know, the Wild Game Feast raises funds in over 38 years from have raised over $2.5 million to give back to vetted nonprofits in the community. So this is a opportunity to serve. It's a service opportunity in the, in the community. So consider it your way of doing hands-on work for our community. And, and we encourage and we encourage you to consider becoming involved with this great opportunity to give to our community. I've said that. Moving on. I'm just trying to go briefly through these so I, we can get to the main act. So um, uh, let's see. Rotary Leadership Institute. We've had a great response on that. We've had 14 members sign up already. Any time to sign up still. It's the February 8th, Saturday morning, and into the afternoon, but it's a short day. And uh, please contact me with any questions about signing up for the RLI. Now, I would like to bring up Susan Crowley to introduce uh, today's speaker. So today we're pleased to have UF Dean Hub Brown as our speaker. He became the Dean of the College of Journalism and Communica Communications in July 2021. He previously served as the Associate Dean for Syracuse University, overseeing research, creativity, international initiatives, and diversity. He also served as an Associate Professor of Broadcast and Digital Journalism. He's been a member of the Syracuse faculty since 1996. During that time, he taught broadcast reporting, newscast production and performance, mass media ethics, and media and diversity. Hub has been active nationally in issues of journalism and mass communications education. He is a member of the Hearst Journalism Awards Steering Committee. He has also served as head of the Electronic News Division of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. As a former member of the Accrediting Council for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication, he has taken part in accreditation site visits at journalism programs around the country. Hub is a member of the National Association of Black Journalists, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and the Broadcast Education Association. Please welcome Dean Hub Brown. Good afternoon, and go Gators. <laughs> It, it is it's great to uh, be here with you and, and it's it's always it's always really positive and fun to be around groups that are about doing good things in the community the the, the sense of fellowship the sense of of uh, wanting to do uh, well for one's you know fellow humans out there you kind of walk out of a place like this is a little bit far a little bit further off the ground because you you're, you're with people who are so positive so for me, it is, it's, it's a real privilege to be here. And um, so one of the things that I'll do here is we'll talk a little bit about, we'll talk a bit about what's happening at the College of Journalism and Communications at, uh, at Florida. 
and um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about what uh, we see on the horizon. Ah, thank you very much. We see on the horizon uh, going forward, and we can talk about you know what's happening in mass communications a little bit too. I'd be happy to take questions as well uh, as we as we go through this. Um, I am proud to lead uh, the College of Journalism and Communication. I'm proud to be at UF. This is an amazing place. Now, the, the incoming president, Ben Sass, said that this is, this is maybe the most interesting university in the whole of the United States. I would add to that. I would say that it's, it's not just the most interesting university, it's the most dynamic university in the United States. This is a place that basically says, we're going to go out and be the best. Just watch us. Watch us go. Uh, and then that you you, you want to be a part of something like that. So it really is, I think, a real privilege to to be there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let's 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 go ahead and um, do a little presentation here. So this is some of the facts around um, the uh, the college, uh, and I'm going to start off here with a little presentation that we show to our um, prospective students. Go ahead, sorry. It's really exciting. The University of Florida is a top five public university and home to one of the nation's most respected communications. The U.S. College of Journalism and Communications is where your story begins. Build your storytelling skills in advertising, journalism, public relations, or film and TV production. Work alongside professionals in state-of-the-art, real-world settings that will make you stand out to employers. Collaborate and learn new skills that are in high demand across all industries. Immerse yourself in a community of communicators with shared interests and goals who will become lifelong friends and mentors. As a part of the Gator Nation, you are connected to a family of loyal alumni who offer advice and open doors to new opportunities. Start your story, build your momentum, and launch your future at the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communication. Little nutshell there. Thank you. So a little bit of a, a little bit of us at a glance. Thank you for that. Um, we, we we hope that freshmen just want to just run through a wall and do it exactly as you. Um, but at a glance, a few things that uh, we can we can talk about here. Right about now, we're sitting at an enrollment of about twenty five hundred undergraduates in, the, in the communication. That among uh, journalism programs in the United States, journalism mass communications program makes us among the larger of them uh, in the country. Um, we also have more than 1,000 graduates. Nearly, well, more than 900 of those 1,000 graduates are online. We have a very large uh, Masters of Mass Communications online program, uh, and our students are from all over the world uh, in that program. It has grown substantially over the last uh, several years. You would guess, of course, and you'd be right, part of that was from, from uh, the pandemic, but, that growth has continued as we've sort of moved away from that era. Uh, so that's a, that's a big feature of where we are. We're about 73 faculty. Our graduation rate uh, among undergraduates is about 80%. That's pretty good uh, over a course of four years, very good. Um, our internship rate, now what this is, is over the four years, 77% uh, of our students have been out in the field, out in their professions at an internship during the four years. So more than three quarters of them. Some of them take multiple internships. That's at least one. Um, <clears throat> we have what we call immersion venues. So the CJC basically operates as what we call a um, teaching hospital. We call it, the, we, we use it as, the, we call it the teaching hospital method. Uh, and what that simply means is that 
we're not just teaching about the real world, we are the real world. We have what we call these immersion venues. The agency is an advertising and public relations firm that has real world clients that our students are producing content for. Um, the Walt Disney Company is among our clients. Uh, the, uh, they're, they're doing work for marketing around uh, the, um, uh, the channel Hulu and others uh, within uh, the Disney environment. And so that's happening there. Um, the Innovation News Center creates news for all of our platforms, uh, whether it's on the air or whether it's uh, online. And so they're doing, um, it's, a, it's a large number of students with their professional editors working with them. Um, we have Gator Vision. So all that stuff, when you, go to the, when you go to the swamp and you look at the big screens and you see what's going on, all that content is produced in our building. And our students are a part of the production of that content. So the next time you see all of that, um, know that it's coming from Weimar Hall. Um, <clears throat> the television side, we've got two television stations, five radio stations in our building. Uh, we, we have, of course, WUFT, which is the NPR news and information uh, uh, station for North Central Florida. But we also have WRUF, which is the ESPN affiliate. Here. We have a country radio station, we have classical, and we have GHQ, which is program for students. And all of those, again, students are able to, to find a home uh, and do work while they're studying in any of those places. Uh, we also have what we call the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. We, uh, we train people to be um, on-air meteorologists. Uh, we call them MITS, meteorologists in training. And they work with us on the, on FPREN and on all the weather forecasting that takes place. Uh, FPREN is a vital source of information when there are really serious storms here. And so every summer, uh, they are going into action. Uh, and what they do is they provide that emergency information down to your local area, all over the state of Florida. And we also serve the state of South Carolina in doing that as well. We have three trained uh, professional meteorologists on staff that work with our students there. So we're providing vital information as far as that's concerned. In terms of our makeup, one of the things we want to try to do is to look like America. So when we, when we talk about that, we talk about how diverse our population is uh, to reflect what it's like um, all the way across the board in the United States, all different kinds of diversity, whether it's age or region or, or affiliation, all kinds of uh, and so we uh, try to make sure we do that. We have about 35,000 living alumni. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to meet all of them, I think, before this is done. So we'll, we'll um, have a look at academics. So we are four departments in the College of Journalism and Communications, uh, Advertising, Public Relations, and Media Production Management and Technology, which is TV and film that is not journalistic, but dramatic or comedic or, or all those sorts of things. They also do media management. We're teaching people how to run media organizations. Um, we, uh, we have, of course, our professional master's graduate program and one of the largest PhD programs of really any college of journalism and communications in the country. Um, a lot of the more professionally based journalism and mass communications programs tend to have either no um, doctoral program or very small ones, but we are, we, we definitely are out there generating a lot of people who are going to be the next generation of scholars in communications. And we do get a lot of recognition. Our students are doing very, very well. Um, the Hearst Awards, the Hearst Journalism Awards competition that you see there, that's considered the Pulitzer Prizes of Journalism. Uh, it is a competition of, of among students, undergraduate students, in the accredited universities around the country, the accredited programs. Uh, and uh, this past year around, in the overall competition, we were number two in the country. We were number one in the writing competition. There are 14 different competitions. And we were the only university of all of those who entered who had entrance in all 14 competitions of the Hearst uh, Awards, which is pretty substantial. That's a lot of work around magazines, around multimedia, around photography, around broadcast journalism, around sports. We have students who are involved in all of those areas and they're doing really outstanding work. So it's incredible uh, that we, the kinds of things that we've had. And we pride ourselves on having effective teachers. 
which is why I feel it's important to note that we've had six UF Teachers of the Year in the past 15 years among all the thousands of faculty at the University of Florida. And I think that's a, that's a pretty substantial thing for them. They're, they're fantastic people. So moving to the centers and programs, not just, we're not just doing things in terms, of, in terms of working with the next generation of professionals. We're working on other things as well. And um, that does come down to centers and programs. Uh, the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information and the Breckner First Amendment Project work together on issues of freedom of information. Um, when, you're, when you're talking to people who, are, who have done deep work in terms of what government is doing, uh, we want to open processes of government more so that the people can understand what they're doing. And so we are very, very much involved in that in the First Amendment Project and the Center for Freedom of Information. And we have scholars who are working on issues around the First Amendment, around not just the freedom of speech, not just the freedom of the press, but all the freedoms, all five freedoms of the First Amendment. And so the First Amendment um, project is big as far as that's concerned. Our Center for Public Inf Interest Communication helps uh, organizations, nonprofit organizations, by, uh, by providing them with expertise in communication so that they can do their jobs better, so that they can be change agents in their communities to work for on behalf of communities. Our consortium for trust in media and technology is brand new. Uh, the consortium is uh, really about opening up dialogue around trust, around truth, around how do we do better in, in terms of trusting what we see, what we hear, what we read. You know, we live in this era of deep fakes, of misinformation, of disinformation. There's a lot of people who are trying to take information and work it to their advantage. There are still such things as truth. You know, we teach our students that you don't just, you don't just interview people to, to decide whether or not it's raining. You don't just say, hey, are, is it raining? You say no and you say yes. No, you stick your hand out the window and find out if it's raining yourself. And that's verification of fact is very fundamental to what we do. Journalism is a discipline of verification. And so doing the things that strengthen those processes will hopefully lead people to trust what they read and what they see more. We have to show our work. We have to be accountable to citizens. And that's what the, that's what the consortium is about. Uh, the Media Infects and Technology Lab does a lot of work around um, artificial reality. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of different kinds of things about AR and VR, so, so uh, augmented uh, reality and, and uh, virtual reality uh, kinds of uh, systems. These are the kinds of things you'll see where people are doing games with, with those or maybe watching different kinds of movies in VR and AR. But there are also things that happen there that assist folks, say, with disabilities, that augment what they see, augment what they can, can internalize and help them through things. So it's not just the things that have no vision, but things that actually might be things like, remember when we had Google Glasses, remember that thing where it added information? There are systems that are being developed that really are much better than that. And so augmented reality is what's happening there. And we have scholars who are working on that. Um, and then the STEM Translational Communication Center is really about the, um, the translation of scientific advance for people. So when there is a new development out there, if it's in medicine, especially right now in medicine, we do a lot with communication around cancer and uh, around your best treatments as far as cancer is concerned. We work with UF Health, we work with uh, the uh, Cancer Center, and we are doing a lot of work around giving people the tools to understand better what's happening in terms of technology uh, on the health side. Uh, the picture that was there, hmm. No, oh, okay. There it is. Oh, there we go. <laughs> this is quite the setup you guys have. Um, <laughs> so the, 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 the picture there is of a system called Alex. And what it is, is an, an avatar is used to allow people to ask questions um, that uh, might be about their care. And in, in this case, especially around colorectal cancer, but they may not want to ask other folks. They may not want to ask a doctor. They have some things that they are may have some fears about. And the algorithm basically can draw from all kinds of latest 
uh, advances and things like that and come up with answers and give people a little bit more peace of mind. So that's what that's all about. So we're doing a lot of things in very high technical areas, um, but all of them have been in common, giving people more information, giving people more information that they need to be able to manage their lives better. So looking, looking forward then, um, <clears throat> a few things that we're doing academically, I'll just touch on these because I know you might have some questions. Um, but looking forward, we have a number of uh, courses that are de dedicated to data journalism. We want to take a look at how we can use large data sets to help tell big stories out there. And uh, this is really in, in, in um, concert with a lot of what's going on at the University of Florida with regards to uh, artificial intelligence and basically teaching computers to handle large data sets that would take us, if we're sifting through them, great large amounts of time. And, uh, and there's a lot that we can do as far as that's concerned. We're doing more social media education around giving people uh, the tools to understand how their brands are being talked about in the social space. Um, that's good intel for marketers. That's great intel for people who are trying to understand uh, and trying to make money off what's happening out there in the world to give people the things and products that they need. Um, we're doing things around inclusion and equity uh, in the curriculum, uh, mainly because we want to make sure that our students are going into the profession and, and looking at looking at their news newsrooms, looking at different places and saying, so what's missing? What other insights can we bring together in here to give us a better, more accurate way of telling the story of this community? And so we do that. Uh, and we are uh, launching a social media listening lab coming up. And that's, I kind of buried the lead. That's one thing we do sometimes in journalism. But that's a very big facility. It's going to be very exciting when we get that online. So um, very quickly, I'll go through a couple of highlights here. We started a partnership with NBC Universal. Uh, and what that does is it gives students opportunities to hear from some of the professionals within the networks of NBC News, um, and also to give them some experience with people outside the news space and in other spaces in terms of media marketing, advertising, public relations, those sorts of things. We've hired people in the artificial intelligence space for our consortium uh, to do research in AI. Uh, and that's going to be very, very exciting for us. Um, we have done a lot, of, we did a lot of work this past summer around the hurricane. We sent students uh, into the affected areas once the uh, storm had cleared to begin to tell stories of people rebuilding. We uh, supported uh, some of the broadcast outlets there. Um, the radio station for Florida Gulf Coast University had been on for about three days straight. We sent a crew in there to spell them so that people could get some rest and we can continue to give that community information around what was happening close to here. Uh, and we continue to tell those kinds of stories. There's still lots of stories to tell about the aftermath of Ian. Uh, and so that's among the things that we're doing. We, we do very well in things like Giving Day and uh, we do very well in terms of uh, grant activity. Uh, that, that's happening out there, getting the federal government and getting other grant funders to take a look at what we're doing so that we can grow uh, some of that activity out there that we that will help us to really serve citizens better. Um, so that's that's a little bit of a highlight about that. Then a couple of things about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, one of the things that you've heard, I'm sure, if other people from the University of Florida have been here, is uh, the uh, emphasis on artificial intelligence to make this the first AI university in the United States for us to leap forward in terms of the use of AI. Um, our, our part of that conversation is a couple of different things. We use AI to help us to dig further, dig deeper into um, uh, databases to find facts for people. We also want to continue and grow a conversation around ethics in AI. Because these tools are incredibly powerful. And if we do not approach it from the beginning with a sense of a strong sense of ethics, and at the, <clears throat> and at the corner of ethics, again, I know I harp on this, the corner of ethics is about accountability, accountability to the people. And if you're doing that as you're moving forward in your, in your uh, construction of AI tools so that, um, so that you're able to do more, so that you're able to find more facts. If you can keep an ethical eye on that, 
you're going to be a lot better off. And the public will be a lot better off. They need to know what's true. So that's where we're going as far as that's concerned. We're also teaching uh, a lot about uh, computer mediated communication and human machine communication, where humans and computers can work side by side to find you know, better outcomes in terms of, uh, in terms of fact finding. We do a lot, and now the sports, by the way. We do a bit on sports. Um, we're doing, um, we're, one of the things that we do is to establish the college as one of the most comprehensive sports media programs in the country. A lot of people look at sports and they just see journalism. But sports is being talked about and being marketed in so many different ways that are outside of journalism that are opportunities for our students. So we're working there as well, giving people uh, all kinds of opportunities. And the entire realm of sports uh, has just exploded. Uh, it used to be that we just had a couple of different sources and then local television and then high school football and so on and so forth. But look at it now. You know, there are channels and apps and it's multi-billion dollar business and we have name, image, and likeness that we have to deal with. There are so many more complicated issues around sports and around what sports says about our culture. And so we want our students to be prepared uh, to be in that conversation as well. And so we're doing some of that. And, and that involves a lot of hand, hands-on opportunities. Um, we're doing a lot on the stations, but also uh, out there in the field. We're, sending, we're going to be sending a group of students to cover some of the baseball programs during our spring break and there and Major League Baseball's spring training. And so they'll be, at, uh, they'll be at some of those baseball camps. It's, I forget, it's maybe just a couple of weeks till pitchers and catchers report. So it's, uh, it's time to get down there. Um, we're also working on study abroad opportunities. We just sent a group of students to cover an NBA game in Paris to talk about how it is that the French are sort of really adopting what's happening in the National Basketball Association, how that's becoming a source for them. We're also going to go ahead and do a series of the summer um, that is about soccer. Um, so it'll be football culture in the United Kingdom. So we'll be sending a, a group to London to uh, to go to a couple of the English Premier League sites and to go into the communities around them to talk about how soccer relates in culture and what it says about it. Uh, and so there's a number of things like that that we'll be doing. And on the second, we're doing a symposium here about the future of sports media. Some of our alumni will be coming back. Julie Donaldson, who works with the Washington Commanders, Christina Pink, who is um, sideline reporter for Fox Sports. You'll see, uh, you'll see her in those uh, games. They'll be back here. They're Gators. They're going to talk to our students about what the opportunities are. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other things real quick. As I said, we're starting with a um, new social media listening lab. We'll be opening that up in a few weeks. And the idea there is to give ourselves uh, a lot more tools to analyze social media conversations. Um, we're, we have very powerful software that we're training faculty and graduate students on already that's going to help us to understand what, how brands are being discussed in the social space. Um, we think that that particular space is going to be a real beehive of activity for major events. When the Super Bowl happens, we'll have people there basically going through what's being said socially about not just what's happening on the field, but what's happening around the various brands that are doing commercials and those sorts of things that kind of marketing intelligence is super valuable for corporations. We want students to be in the middle of that. Um, election night, that'll be a place where that'll be a very big beehive of activity uh, as we begin to see conversations go really through the country about various kinds of things. So it's gonna help us in a lot of ways. And so we, you know, that, that really is a great opportunity. Here's another one, uh, CJC in, in NYC. This is, a, this is a internship type program uh, that's going to be, I think, extremely exciting. We've been uh, growing our footprint in New York City. We're a, we're a media school. The center of media in the entire world is New York City. We need gators there. We need a permanent gator presence in, in, in New York City, in Manhattan. And so that's what we're doing. We're establishing that footprint. Uh, it'll give students a chance to work with the major corporations major advertising corporations that are there, major public relations firms that are there. Um, obviously, the major networks are all there. And so there is real opportunity there for our students to get 
into those areas, into those um, nerve centers, into those control rooms and suites to see how decisions are being made and to work right alongside folks. And internships lead to jobs. That's one thing I've known from all the years that I've been doing this, is that those internships, those students may start one summer in an internship and the next summer they're coming back on staff. And that's, so it's very important to be able to do those kinds of things. So that's what we'll do there. We, we just sent um, uh, 30 students to the city for a week long experience uh, this past time. We have other groups that are there during the fall and spring semesters and we'll do another large one uh, in the summer as well. So those are some of the major things that are going on. Um, the, uh, the, the, as I said, we're doing some very dynamic stuff right now. And um, there's a lot that's, uh, that, that students can do. And uh, a lot of times people will call it the choose your own adventure kind of a place. And they'll pick from so many different things. But uh, one of the things I, I, I'm so impressed by at the university and, and in the college is the energy of our students. Uh, they, are, they are amazing. They are truly something to, to, to watch them get out there, um, engage the world, learn, and come back and find ways to not just be ready. Because I, I come in saying, you need to be ready on day one. Yeah, day one ready. When you walk into a newsroom, when you walk into a workplace, you're ready on day one. Nothing in there surprises you. They are that, but they're also ready to be leaders on day one. And so, yeah, it's, like I said, it's a real privilege to be where I am uh, in the college at this point. Uh, and so I'll take any of your questions. You got questions. Uh, thanks very much for listening to that. Any, uh, Robert Pounce, former Gainesville Sun columnist. Yes. What, what can be done to save local print media? The Gainesville Sun has done away with its issues section, which was a forum for debate in the community, particularly the university community. Mm -hmm. Gainesville Guardian is doing away with its print version at the end of this month. We see corporate media destroying local journalism and investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. It is the biggest single threat, I think. Um, certainly one of the biggest uh, to, uh, to the journalism. And what can be done right now, uh, we've been in this era of contraction uh, in journalism and uh, across the country for a lot of years now, many decades, uh, and it continues. Uh, we need to be willing to experiment. We need to be willing to take a look at a, a multitude, in my opinion, of different approaches to this multitude of solutions, which means there's, there's still room for for-profit journalism there, but there's also room for non-profit journalism. There's room for different, different ways to do this. There's room for cooperative agreement between places like ours and the newspaper to grow and expand those sorts of things so that we can bring student journalists uh, out there to, uh, to supplement what's happening in the field. Um, we have to train them up quicker to do that. We have to, do, we have to challenge them a lot more but we need to find ways to get to those different places. And we also need to use technology. There's, um, there certainly are a lot of different opportunities for us to devise systems that can begin to pull information out of local board meetings, those sorts of things, anything that generates a transcript, anything that generates a video record, and bring people in to begin to help tell those stories. Uh, so it, it's going to take it's going to take a lot of imagination. And there is no, um, there's no magic bullet. We would have had it already. We would, have, we would have figured it out by now. But we're going to have to get in there and find different approaches that are going to work in different localities. It's all going to, it's, it's going to, I think, uh, require a lot of multiple methods uh, to get there. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Newell. And thank you for this very informative presentation. I did not realize that all of this was going on in the College of Journalism. Do students come in and pursue a generalist path until a certain point and then differentiate? Or do they come in with uh, a, something in mind, like you know, broadcast media or whatever? 
or exactly how do you train them and prepare them for graduation and professional participation? Thanks, for that. that's a good question. Uh, there's a variety of ways that come, that come in. You'll see students who come in and it's like, by God, I'm gonna be a sports reporter. I'm getting out there, I'm going on the sidelines right now. Just put me out there, you know? And they're just ready to go. Um, and, uh, and they just know that that's what they wanna do. Um, and uh, others come in and, and, and they, some of them actually don't know whether or not they wanna be uh, journalists or communicators of any kind. We get a lot of people from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences who see a little bit of what we're doing and go, hey, you know, I might like to do that, so maybe I'll change my history major to advertising, you know, or I'll, I'll, I'll go that way. What, our our uh, provost uh, calls our uh, college, or the majors in our college, found majors. In other words, that many, many of our students come from outside the College of Journalism, learn what's happening within the college, and then change majors, and then become our, our students. It does happen. Um, and so we have, that, we have that very big combination. We also have a, a, not a small number of students who come to us just absolutely sure that this is what they want to do. And then they get inside the college, see what other things are going on, and then they change. Uh, and, it's, and so it's, all, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I have a, um, uh, going back from before I got here, um, a student of mine, a grad student of mine when I was at Syracuse, who was just, he was going into sports. He was just going to be in, he was just going to do all the sideline stuff and be on the air and stuff like that. And we had talked, and I, we had talked a lot, and I had said, you know, knowing you, it's going to bore you. You're going to be bored. You're not going to want to do this. He said, wrong, Professor Brown. I'll get out there and do it. A month into it, he's like, Professor Brown, I'm kind of bored. <laughs> and he turned, he, he went from sports to news. Uh, became a videographer, and now he's one of the best television videographers in the United States. And he and he runs workshops all over the country, where he's teaching people to be better visual storytellers. Which that's everything in television journalism. You need to be able to do that. But um, but boy, he was he was gung ho. So sometimes they don't know until they actually jump into something and figure out what it is that they want to do. And we want to be ready for that. You know, we want to actually allow them to settle in in a place that, that really speaks to them. Can I, do, can I say one more quick thing? Sorry, not to be too verbose. I meant to say this at the beginning, and, uh, and then I just sort of jumped into the talk. But uh, I, uh, I owe my marriage and my family to Rotary. <laughs> because, because my wife, who is Australian, came to the United States on a Rotary ambassadorial scholarship. And, we, and, and she came here, she, she met me, and lucky for me, the rest is history. Um, but uh, that, we got to know the Rotarians in the area who were supporting that. Uh, they were an incredibly supportive bunch. And, um, and we got together, we became friends. One thing led to another, two children and a dog later, here I am. Thank you, Rotary. Thank you, Dean Brown. Uh, that was great, and I, I love that story at the end. Um, you know, we're a very welcoming club ourselves here. You know? <laughs> Always welcome to come as a guest or... Thank you. Um, and I'm glad to hear what's going on with the college and the professionalism and ethics that we need in journalism, especially as we move on in this age of technological change. That's going to be a big challenge, and I'm glad to see you're up to the challenge in the university in meeting that. Um, in appreciation for you speaking today to our Rotary Club, I'd like to present you with this certificate, um, which designates that we're giving some money to the Cade Museum Scholarship Fund for underserved children in your honor. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wow, that's great. I always love to hear things from the university and what they're doing, because they're always on the cutting edge of how things work in our societies. So um, let's see, where are we looking at? Next week, I hope you can join us with your guest again, as our presenter will be John Mathers. He's coming to us from San Francisco. Um, he is the Rotary Climate Action Team and past president of the Rotary Club of San Francisco, um, chairman of that committee. Uh, John will be speaking to us about how Rotarians can take positive 
action to affect climate change. The quote of the day is, journalism is what we need to make democracy work. You might know this name, Walter Cronkite. Um, and, <laughs> and for the last three digits of Safari, it's 595, 595. And we're adjourned.